Hello and welcome to Mindscapes, our series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is Malaysian. He traces his roots to India. He's the founder and chairperson of the Third World Network, believed to be, by many, the most influential voice of the Third World, second only perhaps to the non-aligned movement. He has founded and runs the Consumer Society of Penang and the Friends of Malaysia. I'm delighted to welcome Mahmoud Idris. Thank you. Uh, don't you think that uh, the people's movements with globalization have also, in a sense, uh, become globalized? It looks like that. But I would prefer that globalization has to be a somewhat... Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not in favor of globalization that way. Some, some effort should be done to change that situation. In, in what ways do you object to globalization? One would imagine that with the, uh, you know, with telecommunications, with a shrinking world, we all know a lot more about each other. I don't know. Nobody has uh, so far explained to me how this globalization is going to benefit the third world people and the poor in the third world. And moreover, it has been a, always an uh, unequal relationship with the most advanced world and the uh, less advanced worlds. And through the colonization, this globalization is going on all the last 500 years. It's not a new phenomena. It has further been accentuated to improve their hold on the, the poorer part of the world. Therefore, I don't think by sheer technological changes, therefore, people come, I mean, they, they know each other better, understand each other better. That's not the question. I mean, even the technologies have been, other technologies have been instrumental in exploitation of the other parts of the world. So it is further improving that situation. You've sort of uh, founded and, and you chair the Third World Network, yes. uh, which is sort of, uh, is, 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 is a widely respected alternate voice yes. uh, of the Third World. What is this voice trying to say? What is it trying to communicate? Currently, other things they are trying to impose, we are resisting or what are the things further they, are they want to impose. What are the things that they're looking to impose? Like in the case of um, multilateral agreement on investment, which we are able to gather with other groups of the world to stop it, which means they'll have a free access. They'll be similar to the national groups in form of privileges for the investment, which will be not in the best interest of the countries and nation, nation states. So we're able to stop it. That is one of the major achievements we have had. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the question about the WTO, which are trying to impose free access to everything in terms of trade, investment, everything, you see. So that also we are able to, through cooperation with others, we are able to stop it. And we are able to, I mean, prepare a lot of brief notes, all sorts of efforts in informing third world countries who are able to stand up and to resist that. So therefore, this, uh, the, uh, another one is the, the question of biosafety. There again, they wanted to impose, I mean, on the question of their, their control over the third world, be able to impose, say, stop it. But isn't it sort of ironical uh, that, uh, that it is in many cases uh, supposedly uh, uh, democratically elected governments who represent the will of the people, even though through perhaps an imperfect democracy, uh, who are signing these multilateral agreements? Where does the, what role do the people's movements have uh, as an alternative voice? See, in my view, most of the time this parliamentary democracy doesn't deliver that good system. The elected representatives, how well informed, how they are concerned, how they develop their own understanding of the world situations is very much, very much low. So like groups like us who are very much concerned that internationally a lot of things are being imposed, most of the time, they are very concerned with the power, 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 they won't power. Secondly, the question of known, some of the national interest. They couldn't see beyond the boundaries of the nations. Mm -hmm. So we more or less see, we are not only affected by our developments within the country. Outside the country, what are, what are fixed up by, say, the imperial, former imperial powers, now, now the question of the dominant nations, like, say, in Washington, in Geneva, and these things are not able to understand. So that's why we are playing, playing an important role in terms of bringing to the understanding of the third world representatives and for them to, uh, to work to protect their interests internationally. So what kind of initiatives do you take? 
do you sort of have you organize conferences? We uh, do you go and, and, and support? We publish a daily paper in Geneva called Sun. This Mr. Raghavan is a very former PTI man who is now in Geneva, who is a very informed person who knows all diplomatic movements. They regularly publish the features about various conferences, what are the things, the movements. And we have got our Mr. Martin Kaur, is one of the important person in this, who is responsible for many other actions. He is my colleague, so he has done a lot of good work in this respect. So he go and personally see all the diplomats everywhere. He travels ev uh, extensively to inform all the governments about these things and try to prepare them to work in the conferences. So you work really in a sense as, as uh, a, a lobbying group yes, for the yes. alternative uh, view of, of, of development? Yes. And not only the alternative one, but the personal person to protect themselves from the imposition of the first coalition. You have founded the Consumer Society of uh, Penang. Uh, you are a, a, a businessman yourself, and you, you know, reportedly spend merely an hour or so uh, a day on, on, on making your living. What has prompted this, um, how do I put it, an alternative lifestyle? Really a concern for people, generally. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't doubt we all have to earn a living somewhere, somewhat. But also your own sensitivity towards various things happening in the world, I mean, accompanying the community to various things happening among for the human beings. So we have to be interested. So that provoked me to get involved in this mm -hmm. sort of things. Mm -hmm. So to what, what does the Consumer um, Society of, of, of Penang do? We try to people to consume the right things, which are not necessary for, against injurious to health, wasteful money-wise, and it, uh, detrimental to environment, we are trying to prevent those things. So you work as an advocacy group yes. on, on, on in the areas of, shall we say, essential consumerism or... Yeah, yeah, right, right. You're right, you put it sort of essential uh, consumerism. The, the, yes, the, okay. the minimum, minimum sort of aspects yes, yes, that you, yes, need right. to, you need to... Yes, consume. minimum, yes. But isn't this aspect of a balance yes. uh, as to, uh, you know, what one's minimum needs are? Yes. You know, relative and subjective. Relative and subjective can be say when the question is how people try to skirt around say they because it becomes a need and so on you know but basic needs are there then definitely you need food as we were talking earlier about water we need you know these are things which we have to be given sufficiently to people and you see we don't get I mean clean water or we don't get safe water so this is a major problem but aren't these uh, these sort of these relative issues of need. Uh, as much to do with internal processes of transformation and internal attitudes as they are to do with yes, uh, external you are, you are right, it's a question about as far as internal transformation, that's what we are aiming at. Even if we are questioning the whole civilizational factor, you see, whether sustainability of the world, whether can we go on like this, whether great disparity existing presently, which is, uh, is it just, whether should allow that? All sorts of uh, resources are being wasted on unnecessary things. Well, the masses of suffering, should we allow that? Should we not question that? So these are our very major concern. So would, you, would it be fair to say that there is this spiritual or, or religious dimension to what you do? Of course, it is spiritual dimensions are there. Because we, we as human beings, we also spiritually should be concerned. Our satisfaction doesn't come only consuming more. I mean, more, more or less, it has become a religion. Consumerism has become a religion, you see. That the more you consume, or the the thing where where you uh, what are the things you acquire, it it elevates you or it makes your position improved or better, your status is higher. So that is a very wrong side of values, and you have bended all the these sort of values in and out, day in day in out, day in day in day out. Is the question like in the case of advertisement, the country like India, 60 percent of the people are undernourished, but how much you are spending on your advertisement, on your cigarettes, on your alcohol. So that there's so various type of unnecessary wastage, which rightly should go to the elevation of all these miseries of the people, which we consider as very important. Do you consider yourself a, a, a spiritual, religious person? I'm a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. So what is your, your practice? What sort of practice? I mean, I mean, I'm as a Muslim, I'll pray, I'll do other things, but I don't have no different, I mean, I'm not discriminating anything against. I, I think common humanity, we must help everybody and we must uh, assist everybody in everything. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, is, is there a kind of uh, secular uh, spirituality or, or uh, a secular worldview that could make the same changes or internal transformations possible? See, the secularism differs from place to place. India is very much people advocate secularism. But secularism against the neoliberalism, which says, you know, no sort of uh, uh, godly feeling or uh, you can do freely anything you like, you enjoy anything you like. That I don't agree with those sort of things. Mm -hmm. It has to be a quite a well, just well thought about. I mean, it must be sublimating life in many forms. Man's intellectual aspirations, man's spiritual aspirations, man's physical aspirations, all has to be satisfied. So you cannot completely uh, take out spirituality or even intellectuality. I mean, the religion, only religion, no other things also not sufficient. To, to, to what degree does uh, a people's movement uh, such as yours uh, interface, interact with the formal political processes and structures? Your country has seen sort of uh, a fair amount of political turmoil uh, in, in, in recent years. Have you played a role? Have you had a voice in that process? Or do you try and stay out of it? Some areas we are not inside. Like recent troubles we are not inside. You see, we see as a political infight which don't, we, we don't want to be a part of it. But then excesses we do criticize. But political infight gives a different shape of human rights and all which you are not participating in that sort of thing. So as regards all the governmental functions and actions and laws and enforcements which are not in beneficial of people, we all are very critical and we, we raise these issues. We represent, we raise, we criticize. And in fact, we are running a news uh, letter, a monthly newsletter in four languages, one especially with children, another five altogether. We publish a public, lot of publications. We got programs, uh, educational programs, exhibitions, all type of activities in terms of developing people. Would you be would you be willing to sort of accept the possibility of, of or the inevitability of of, of uh, a people's movement acquiring real power and, and hence being a part of the, the, the political process to be able to ultimately change the structures, to be able to reverse uh, decisions and policies. What do you see your relationship as, as to power, ultimately? First, I would think, first of all, to prepare people for that situation rather than taking power. I mean, just taking power doesn't solve the problem. We have seen in many things, starting from the communist system, then many other systems, uh, I mean, philosophies which uh, ultimately failed. Also, you must also prepare, either you take power, prepare, or prepare to take power. That should be the approach. But what is the notion of preparing people for power? In, in what ways do you prepare In actually, people? I would very much prepare people to assert their rights. And in what ways uh, would you sensitize people, educate people uh, as to their rights? Because rights, in some senses, are also relative. Rights with responsibilities. One, you see, you cannot divorce. That again, another problem comes, you know. If people have become absolute rights, also not possible. You have to have a responsibility for doing that. You know. And you see, now you see, in many countries, you have got rampant corruption. This is how to eliminate it. So therefore, it affects everybody's life. And this corruption is now recently being banned in the same old national uh, corruption, nepotism, cronyism, and so on. This sort of a phenomenon we have to remove from the society. How do you remove it? By resisting By educating it? people, by educating people, exposing it, mm -hmm. bringing to public attention. Does this view, the strategy, to what degree does it uh, allow for, accept, encourage, facilitate alternate uh, points of view? In India, there are small isolated groups that believe, for example, that uh, a violent change is what is necessary and is possible. There are other groups that believe that it is really non-violent change uh, that, is, uh, that is necessary and, and most appropriate and will work. And you can have grassroots movements. Uh, sometimes we have the illusion that somehow all grassroots movements have the same ideology or the same philosophies. Uh, there could be diversity and divergence uh, amongst them. Uh, what, how do you resolve those differences? It's again a very major problem, as you see, the post-colonial situation countries like India, there were great expectations were raised before independence that independence will bring all the solution to the problems of the people. It doesn't bring. 
So it takes very different shapes, you see. People see their disappointment in parliaments and assemblies, and it becomes most power-seeking groups, which has no interest, genuine interest in people. And their behavior, their actions, their movements are, so far people don't see much of change. This poverty, their deprivation, their misery, this all sorts of backwardness, problems, and so on. So there are groups, as you mentioned, the three types of groups, one want to so legally, non-violently, slowly gravitate to do that, you know, which is not the second group you say the grassroots movements, you know, which which may be in a way positive. Third one you mentioned this they took violence. Sometimes I sympathize with them also in the sense because they are pushed to the wall, they don't see the changes. You see. So being impatient they're trying to so they have to create a space for changes. So that's all I can comment on those things. You know, very often these are very attractive intellectual concepts and, and, and there are only very few people like you who actually go in there uh, from uh, positions of, of, well, let me say, relative privilege. Where is this, this impetus to change going to come from? Do you feel optimistic that this sort of this, this sweeping tide of globalization described by the WTO and, and, and the media and, 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 and the Western industrialized nations can actually substantially be resisted? See, first and foremost, as regards why now things are not taking place, that we have to question. From my own observation, I would say prevailing education system, prevailing media is blocking all changes. So people must work towards the how to change the education system how to change the media representation, which has become a great obstacle in people's welfare. Let's look at the education system. Uh, I, I think there's, there is a consensus in, in, in the alternate paradigm as to what the educational system should be like. Yes. And there have been some sort of experiments with individual institutions and schools. Uh, in a poor country where we're still looking for funding for education from the state predominantly, and you've already sort of articulated one's relative helplessness in being able to impact the paradigms of, of political power. How do we begin to do this? How do we begin to catalyze change in the education system, for example? What have you been, have you, do, you, do you feel that this is an area you've been able to work in? And, and if you would, how would you approach this? I do criticize the education system. In the major, we must create groups who will openly come and criticize the education system and try to seek a change. Mm -hmm. And personally, you, what is the objective of having this has been again and again, time and again, people said, what was the great objective of Indian, Indian education system? Mm -hmm. From the time of Macaulay, it was to uh, feed into the industries and to the, into the commerce and so on, and give a government bureaucracy. It hasn't got developed the right-minded. And moreover, the universities are more or less, they're just borrowing the ideas from the other mm -hmm. advanced countries, and which are more, may not be very suited to these places. So this all, there must be groups bringing out openly these issues and discuss and raise the issues with the people and really struggle towards now we see there are what is the literacy rate in this country after independence about 40 50 percent what is the literacy rate for the women so these are the major areas we have to cover and see how we can remove all this then from there we can progress how has malaysia been able to uh, cope with and, and, and work around its educational system education system they have as far as I could say, I'm not very happy with the education system, but in terms of expansion, it's very, very good. You see, about 90, 95% of, of people are literate, and there are a lot of higher education when they locally and overseas they go and do. But that's not a very satisfying factor because I, I don't consider that tertiary education is giving the right ideas to the people. It's a, it's, it's a cliche that what we really need to, to cultivate is, 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 is wisdom and not uh, literacy. Or, or in, in, in that sense? Wisdom as well as the question, you see, first and foremost, what type of human personality develops? It de-skills, and it, suppose a farmer's son comes to school, first of all, he looks down upon his father, and he looks down upon his culture. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't like to wear his own dress. He doesn't like to eat his own food. So that sort of value system should not be there. You see, the education, first of all, change that sort of situation, where you have, Develop your own pride of your own heritage, your own inheritance, your own traditions, and also, which are very good. There may be bad traditions, but overall good things we must be very proud of it, which normally make us to feel inferior. See, if you speak in English, you become a superior. You wear a Western dress, you become superior. 
you won't go to a Western type of a club, you have become superior. That sort of situation must change. And you become, a, I mean, suppose it also instills arrogance when people acquire certain degrees, they become superior among their own community. Which all, that sort of uh, situation must change. You have also, uh, 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 you know, run, managed, inspired a Friends of Malaysia. Uh, Friends uh, of the Earth, it's an environmental group. A group in, 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 in Malaysia. Um, uh, do you really feel that, uh, you know, national boundaries uh, that are diminishing because of, uh, we've mentioned the communications revolution in some ways, uh, people are traveling to each other's countries uh, a lot more. Uh, what room, what space do national boundaries have uh, when, uh, you know, environmental issues sort of also, apart from the globalization that we've mentioned, mean a shrinking planet? You know, what happens in, in, in the rainforests in Malaysia impacts what happens in other parts of the world. So where do you see national boundaries on the global environment agenda? You see, there must be transboundary arrangements in terms of uh, prevailing nation states. I don't know, even the nation states also a foreign concept. You know, then uh, I don't know what, what sort of political arrangements were there then. But it gets to be transboundary arrangements. You know, but that's why they're trying internationally, which they are not succeeding because the dominant powers are not allowing. Suppose the climatic change is a very major problem where the Americans are not agreeing. So similarly, this biosafety, genetic erosion, desertification, water problem, there are many, many problems. Law of sea conference, all these have become obstacle by the major nations. See, they have wanted to be, you are right in saying the nation states not within that we have contain it. It has to be a transboundary and international arrangements in that. Do you see a future for the nation state? Prevailing situation, I don't know what sort of shape it is going to take because Everybody caving into this sort of dominant position of World Bank, IMF, and the question of WTO, it is becoming a very serious problem. It's very, very distressing. I know how, how to face this situation. If, if you were prime minister of a world government, or you, you, you were in this, in, in this position of uh, uh, being able to uh, catalyze change, what are some of the major elements that you would bring into the international discourse, that you would that you would bring into into how do I put this? Uh, you know, obviously, uh, the people in, in in the dominant positions of power aren't going to just sort of relinquish it. Yes. Uh, in 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 the in the sort of freedom struggle in India, uh, Gandhiji evolved a strategy of satyagraha and, and nonviolence, and 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 in some ways, to sort of uh, force the dominant colonial power to confront itself, its truth, and, and, and worked uh, with, with local, with, 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 with the people uh, within the country, uh, their processes of internal transformation, and in that sort of cataclysmic, um, nonviolent confrontation, perhaps, uh, change emerged. What kind of processes do you see that are ultimately going to reverse uh, the, the, the forces of, of see, power and dominance? Presently, myself, the internal changes also didn't take place much after the independence. You see. If you look at that, many of the third world countries, land ownership is a major problem. If you see the great, uh, I mean, concentration of population flowing into the uh, urban areas, the causes are they no stake in their own lives, so they have to seek some living. So similarly, Asia, Africa, Latin America, all this part of the world, major population has no stake. And they are being overly exploited internationally and locally. If there were to be changes, first of all, like a country like India, say India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, there must be a genuine land reform. And they must be able to improve the lives in the rural situation. They must be investment wise, there must be a sudden change in the investment pattern which are not so focused on urban. It is more balanced between rural and other. What are the forces? What do you see in, in a kind of dream uh, scenario or, or in a utopian scenario that will actually bring this about? The people will stand up, if, if they will be mobilized by leadership like you. If you're thinking about the utopian, I'm personally worrying, I'm a very despaired and despondent and thinking that uh, the world is facing an apocalyptic situation, a doomsday phenomenon, because at a mass level, there's no understanding of what are the things that are developing worldwide, environmentally, resource-wise, population-wise. All these are very serious situations developing. In that, people are just living like they used to say when the room was burning and Nero was fiddling. The same thing politicians saw. They're thinking of their power most of the time. 
So the problem is that the great disparity existing between them, I mean, a small minority, there are about 10, 20 percent of the population which is causing the problem to the world. If the disparity is not changed, the world has no future. How might it change? Do you have a vision, uh, a, a possibility that, that this might happen and in what form and shape that might take? I think it's a very big order for me as far as to say, as far as concerned, you know, because it is, looks very, very sad and very frightening to me in the sense. As you say, I give you an example. America is using 26000 per capita income. Bhutan is $80,000. Here, drinking water is a problem, shelter is a problem. They, they throw many things out. Every day, they, well, the amount of toilet paper they're using will not be sufficient. What are the papers you are using for the whole of India's one billion people? So similarly, such a disparities are not banished. What focus? And you're asking us strategies how to change this. It's a good question you're asking, but that means they, we must create an internal changes in that country plus this country, you know, where we can arouse the masses. Who are larger people in that country is also suffering whom we have to go and change, but it needs a worldwide effort. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.